So, again, I want to talk today about confidence. And in some Christian circles, this word does get a bad rap, probably because people who project confidence can rub us the wrong way. And I preached a few months ago on the topic of confidence, and if you want to look that up, it was on June 6, 2021, so I commend that sermon to you. And But if you were in church with us, you might recall that I wanted us to understand that with confidence in God, we are able to have confidence to do God's good work. But we tend to have confidence in other things which is not God's assignment to us. But like I said already, I've already preached that sermon. And this time, what I'm going to be focusing on instead is the next step. Once we have that confidence in God, once we write our confidence, what comes next? Do we take a leap forward? Or do we stay stuck? And that's what I want to explore today, how we get unstuck. Because as we take a look at the next step in our lives, at the next step for our faith, at the way in which our connection to God can turn into concrete action, I would submit that probably each of us holds a struggle in taking that bold step forward. I know I do. And I'll speak for myself. I've had some big wins in my life so far. I know I'm pretty accomplished. And sometimes, actually, that becomes crippling. Before I get into the example I'm going to give you on what I mean by this, I'm just going to say that it's not flattering. I know that. (laughs) So here we go. As my bestie Tracy and I refer to ourselves, we are A-plus students. Now, that doesn't mean that every grade we ever earned was an A+. It just means that we have that expectation for ourselves. For example, a few months ago, I had to submit my Yale transcript for something, and I noticed that I had earned an H- in UCC polity from the Reverend Kent Salati, who gave me permission to tell this story. And I'm going to tell you that when I saw that H-, I was... Incensed! An H minus. Now, just for those of you who don't understand Yale grading, Yale is way too obnoxious to just do regular letter grades like A, B, C, D, but this is more or less the equivalent of an A minus. Anyway, I was furious when I remembered that minus, so that I sent the good Reverend Kent a note with expletives implied about why would he do this to me when I saw this this summer? Why would you do this to me, Kent, I asked. I was an excellent student in that class. And I think my now friend Kent said something like, well, actually, Kaji, that's the highest grade I ever give, which, for the record, I think is a terrible policy. Grade deflation is whatever. Anyway, he and I have this fight. But that's how I am as a student. I am obnoxiously obsessed with my own achievement. Reverend Stephanie is standing right here and she's nodding her head. And I think she means because she's the same way. Yeah, we we are simpatica on that one. And if I don't think I'm gonna achieve at the highest level, the thing is though, chances are I'm not gonna even try. Instead, instead, I commit the sin of taking my talent and burying it in the ground, and I won't even get started. Why do you think I haven't pursued a doctorate level degree yet? It's this, I get in my own way, as did the person described in this parable. And I do the same thing that they did. I blame someone else. It's your fault I buried my talent. It's your fault I didn't even try. It's that H minus, it's the anxiety dreams, it's, the, it's, it's everything that is getting in my way. I am so wrapped up in the myth of my success story that I often wind up stuck and paralyzed and unable to try. Or it can work in the other direction. I hate to fail. 
And I have failed so often in maintaining, for example, my body health, which makes it almost impossible for me to address major issues like the weight I've obviously gained during the pandemic. And at some point, I just had to deal with it. But it was so hard to get started because I didn't want to fail. It was easier to just ignore it than to give it a try. And now I'm going to quote my colleague, Jason, who had a real word on this phenomenon. And his point is so good, we're even going to put it up on the screen. Success and failure are both temptations. You see, success will tempt us to become stuck. And failure will tempt us to never start at all. Whew. Did you catch that? Did you write it down? You should. Success and failure are both temptations. Success is not final. And failure is not fatal. Success will tempt us to become stuck, and failure will, temp will tempt us to never start at all. Mm. And I believe that is why Jesus reacts so strongly to the behaviors he's describing in the parable of the talents. Jesus wants, needs even, for us to abandon our stuckedness. And I'd submit, so do we. Church industry spends a lot of time talking about helping us to understand our purpose. But here's what I think. I think many of us know something of our purpose. We might even know the next thing that we need to do. I think a number of us, though, stop there and we dig the hole and we bury the talent because we're scared. But here's what I want to say. You... You right there, you. You are prepared for so much more than that. God has already done that. That talent, it's yours, yes, but it's also God's. But maybe you're scared. Maybe you're scared of failing. Maybe you're scared of what it might mean to succeed. But I think Jesus wants us to shift our focus. Because this isn't really about us per se. It involves us. But on a God path, we already have, or will have, everything that we will need. If God has assigned you, then God will equip you. Do you understand that? If God has assigned you, then God will equip you with everything you need to complete the assignment. You can be confident in that. And this is the perfect example of how God's promises are written into all of our lives, including Jesus's. Remember, as followers of Jesus, we are meant to take steps like Jesus did. He himself fell on his knees in the darkness of the garden, praying and hoping that this cup would pass from his hands. He himself felt stuck. But then he got off his knees and he trusted in God's promises. And I'm going to be honest, it got worse, right, before it got better. One might have thought, and many have argued, that Good Friday was a failure. In fact, the most power pe powerful people in the land thought that it was so. The cross appeared to be a failure, and Jesus' followers were tempted to think so too. But can I tell you something about God? Can I share some good news? Because failure to the world is a perfect place for God to shine. What the world calls death is God saying, wait a minute. What the world calls an ending is God saying, wait three days. What feels like you're stuck in is God saying, watch this. 
And as I close, I just want to draw on the text that my friend Pastor Jason shared with the Boulevard about all of this, about how we overcome the temptations of success and failure. And this is the passage he shared from Hebrews. Do not, therefore, abandon that confidence of yours. It brings great reward, for you need endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet, in a very little while, the one who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. My soul takes no pleasure in anyone who shrinks back. But we are not among those who shrink back and are so lost. But we are among those who have faith and so are saved. And that was Hebrews 10, 35 to 39. I don't know about you, friend. But I think I just want to say that I am sick and tired of shrinking back. I'm ready to take my fears and to learn from them. I'm ready to be more persuaded by God than by my temptations. I am ready to put my confidence in what God has already given me. I'm ready to live out my confidence in what God can do in things unseen. Folks, our assignments await. Now what? Amen.